Hello, welcome to the Broach Stages digital series reveal, where we invite you to go behind the scenes and meet some of the groundbreaking artists the Broad Stage is commissioning for our future seasons. My name is Ilan Mazzini, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the director of programs and activation. As we all watch from different lands, this stream comes to you from the ancestral home and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people, where the Broad Stage itself has the honor of residing. The incredible artistry we get to share through Reveal includes today's conversation with the team and upcoming episodes with Wayne Shorter, Esperanza Spalding, Angelique Kijo, Emily Johnson, and many others. The idea behind Reveal was to give you an opportunity to immerse yourself in their creative journey. Through discussions, demonstrations, performances, and exclusive footage, you can witness firsthand how ideas bloom into fully staged presentations. The entire Reveal series can be viewed over and over at our website, thebroadstage.org. Today is our second Reveal episode for Reconstruction, still working, but the devil might be inside which we plan to bring to the stage the season after next. Reconstruction explores intimacy, particularly between black identifying and white identifying Americans in the historical and present day context of an anti-black United States. We're going to step inside the reconstruction rehearsal room and learn how intimacy is being created, deepened, questioned, and supported by the role of a process chaplain. We'll find out what that is and how the process chaplain influenced the making of this work. So as you listen to the conversation, please add your thoughts and questions in the comment section. We will uh, wind up with a Q&A toward the end of the program. Now it is my pleasure to welcome the team into our digital space. Reconstruction co-directors, Rachel Chavkin and Jalen Levingston, and Jalen's gonna join us a little later. He's having some computer difficulty. Team artists, Danae Benton and James Harrison Monaco, and the process chaplain herself, Milta Vega Cardona. Hello to the team. I'm gonna exit the screen, but we'll help him to field the questions. So keep the, your comments coming. And now I pass it to you, Rachel. Enjoy everyone. Thank you so much, Elan. Um, hi, you all. Hey. Hello, family. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Hello. I, I know often we start um, with just like a brief check-in. So I wonder if like we have so many things to discuss, but it feels like it would be nice to just go around and, and briefly speak to how, how do you come to this conversation today? Mm -hmm. And um, and if you want to maybe also add in um, whose lands you are speaking from as well. That's right. Does mm -hmm. someone want to start us? Sure, I'll start. So I am called Milta Vega Cardona, and I enter this space today um, with a tremendous amount of appreciation sitting on land of the Lenape people uh, in the home that my sister has in uh, Middletown. And um, there are at least 20 other family members outside of this room, starting from our youngest um, grand, for me would be grandnephews, the twins, um, which are who are three year old to our, um, I'm the matriarch and my brother-in-law um, becomes the patriarch uh, who's actually um, three months older than me. Um, we are celebrating today the ability to be able to come together and to share with each other after a long year of being separated. So very excited to be able to do this um, as I am being held up by those who on whose shoulders I stand. And um, two of the people out there, Rachel, um, are my daughters, Jasmine and Jomisha, uh, who have provided all the space in the world so that I can be who I am. So. Oh. 
Beautiful. Milta, do you want to pass it to someone? Sure, James. Thank you, Milta. Um, I'm doing well. I'm, uh, I'm on Lenape territory also. And I'm just happy to be here and see your faces. That is, that is how I come, come to this space. I'll pass it to Danae. Hello, I am also doing well and also on Lenape territory and um, a little scattered and always amazed at how much <laughs> this room and the intention of being in this space with any of us immediately grounds me into what I care about. And it's like a magic trick. And so I'm thankful <laughs> to be here because <laughs> I didn't know if my energies would come together and here they are um, to you, Raquel. Thank you. I love that. Um, I am on uh, Lenape Hoking and Mohican territory, uh, in colonially known as Newburgh, New York, and have actually been here, speaking of grounding, Danae, been here all week with the small sort of, uh, they are getting paid for the work, but they all volunteered for it, um, uh, of a small cohort of folks from inside the reconstruction room known as the Weaver Committee or the <laughs> Weaver Bears who have been um, up here all week working and weaving uh, and some very beautiful cosmology has begun to really emerge for like thinking about yeah, how um, how they want to put the material of three years generated thus far mm -hmm. and still more to come, how we might begin ordering that in some way. Um, so that is a very nice place to be like leaving and having this conversation from, or, you know, it's very present. And um, so shifting into, shifting into conversation, um, uh, you know, as as Ilan said, the a focus here is intimacy, and she spoke to intimacy certainly between white identifying, which I am part of the white identifying cohort, um, uh, uh, and black identifying folks in the Reconstruction Room, and broadly within the context of an anti-black. America. That is certainly part of the intimacy that we're working with. But we're also working, I think, with many other forms of intimacy, including self-intimacy, including intimacy. We have um, a number of uh, participants and everyone, for those watching who may not know this, everyone who is in the reconstruction room is both, uh, is a multi-hyphenist. Um, so everyone is a writer, is often a performer or designer or dramaturg or composer or many of the above. Um, and uh, we have mixed race collaborators. We have a vast diaspora, even within the black uh, collaborators within the within the work. Um, uh, and and certainly even intimacy between white folks. Um, uh, so all of that within the context of the country. And I think all of that took, we started using the word intimacy. I want to pay homage to both um, one of our core collaborators and leaders of the Weaver Committee, Jillian Walker, um, uh, who brought in her own obsession with a Black feminist academic named Hortense Spillers who has done a great amount of work and thinking about the idea of intimacy. And Jillian shared a lecture with us that we all watched um, that uh, Professor Spillers gives, which ends with the um, incredibly striking quote, without freedom, love and intimacy don't matter. Uh. Um, after which she leans into the mic and says, okay, thank you. And then walks away. <laughs> so it's like one of the great mic drops um, in American thought. Oh, sure. So Milta, I wondered if I can pass it to you first and foremost to actually talk. I know intimacy is something you have thought a lot about. So would you think about that out loud here for a bit? Absolutely. Um, so 
uh, you all know that I break up the word intimacy into into me, you see. So beginning in, to, in a place and a time where I can open myself up and truly allow myself to be seen. So the idea of intimacy is actually the third step in the process of anti-racist, anti-oppression uh, dialogue, and then moving to defining where that sits in us and beginning the recovery of our humanity, right? So intimacy, and to me, you see, I must first be able to trust, to trust that there's going to be a, a further giving that goes beyond what the limitations of our titles and our positions and our place. Um, for us as people of color, you know, our place is very much defined in this society. Uh, so intimacy is a step that allows us to be able to come with everything that we have to the table and see them as our gifts and then begin to look at those that have come to be known as white as part of that process because it is you know it, it is the forming of that chain that actually creates the vision forward prior to that prior to that you know ability to be able to see beyond our anointed race determinants we are simply working from our head up. That there's no movement to our heart, our gut, exactly, and then back again. Huh. So we'll get very intellectual about what needs to be done and how we do it together. And you know, there'll be people telling me um, if they can't see me that I need to be behaving in a certain way because I'm Latina. And this is what's expected of me, the big hoops and, you know, whatever else. But when I'm seeing and when I can see, then I find within Rachel, within James, within Danae, what carries me, what holds me up. Intimacy is about being allowed to be everything and know that I am not here alone that i come from the we okay and i am held up by the not who i am but whose i am right so the we are us and the reconstruction room creates the foundation and roots it roots it in the principle of intimacy and accountability so, and I said, intimacy is a third step, right? So the first step is to come to a space of seeing each other, right? And then the next step is trusting. And trusting is the hardest. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest because the opposite of trust is control, right? So, you, Rachel, you can control everything. You're the director. You can, or you can step back and trust, which has been the highest level of humanity that has happened in this room, okay? Because with you taking your power and defining it and knowing it and being clear about it, you became intimate with that, no longer hiding it, but allowing it to be, and then opened up to trust the process and allowing for that to become the basis of how we came together. And moving through that, you know, I mean, we've been together, so we know what the backstory is, but the incredible amount of healing that this intimacy creates. Okay, when we are in our rec recovery process, of that intimacy and holding it and bringing it deeper and then allowing it, you know, to flow. There are all kinds of magics that start to be conjured and develop and freedom. You know, liberation is an action word. 
And before we can become liberated, we have to be intimate because we have to be clear about the power that we bring to the table. Ashe. Ashe. Good? Beautiful. I was just actually, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, Danae or James, do you want to add in and maybe like, if there are ways that your understanding of intimacy has evolved over the course of making this or um, thinking about those moments of uh, opening for you in some way. Yeah, two things come up for me uh, as far as tangible things that shifted for me in the room around that level of trust was one, we realized that we could only move at the pace of trust in our space and how inherently anti-capitalist that is because it's not efficient, <laughs> you know, to, to decide that we are only going to create at the pace that we can actually trust each other in this room as black, white, indigenous and de identifying people who if we looked at the history of our ancestors have given us no reason to trust each other um, was fascinating and for me, the shift that happened, there is this exercise we did where, you know, the Black and Indigenous artists in the space, we've been engaging with our ancestors a lot in our relationships to our personal ancestors to bring this work into the space. And we realized that due to shame, most of the white identifying people in the room, we had all decided that white ancestors weren't invited into this space. And so it felt like it wasn't costing us the same amount of blood <laughs> and pain and, and power. And I remember when that happened and we all faced the terrifying nature of that exercise. For me, I noticed after that day, we started working a lot faster. There was, there were like processes we didn't need in the same way, contingency groups we didn't need in the same way. It was like, I don't know, it was like a blood sacrifice was made for everyone or some sort. Oh, and we were able to like start getting shit done. And I was like, wow, you know, it's not that every process has to take seven mm -hmm. years. It's just like, mm -hmm. what are we willing to do to actually make this mm -hmm. space safe enough for us to have pace? And so that 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 level when it comes to intimacy was something that I learned that it wasn't just kumbaya intimacy. It's like, what are you willing to talk, but it's, you know, uh, what kind of skin do you have in the game, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'll say. Yeah, I was gonna just mention the exact same exercise for me as like a, a and even calling it exercise feels like light. Um, okay. Though that's what it was. it was, and it was like <laughs> specifically, um, yeah, it was like the assignment that, that essentially was given was for the white identifying collaborators to come in with text, ideally, that had been like really written by or said out loud by and recorded from from uh, like a white American past and, and especially, um, uh, yeah, a slavery past, um, a deep, deeply racist past, an anti-Black past. Um, and to like embody it, um, almost like a, almost like an exorcism, but that also feels to me exactly. like, yeah, it was that. I just, I, I hesitate to like, um, yeah. it didn't feel like a theater game, I guess is all I mean to say. It, it felt very alive and I was very resistant to it for sure at the start, as I think a lot of us were. And now looking back, I think like there was a, there's a convenience to having been resistant to it, like shame, I think the word Danae just used, for sure was there. And I'm thinking about the ways that like shame can be a form of power, I guess, because like the ability to just, like something that came up in the room, I, I don't remember if, I don't remember who said it exactly. I feel like many, many people did, but of just like, I feel like I remember you saying it, Danae, and I apologize if you didn't say it, but I have a memory of you saying like, like that the, the black identifying collaborators had no choice but to like constantly engage with the ancestors and with the like trauma and the brutality of of what was done to them and that the white identifying collaborators could very conveniently on our own terms when we wanted to like step in and out of the weight of that and it felt like i mean exactly as you already said putting skin in the game but i i just remember 
Milta then pulling me aside at one point and kind of saying to me directly, like, you, you just have to deal with your past and who you come from. And like, you have to love those people even as you like despise these things that they did. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing badly, Milta, I apologize. But okay. um, I still think about it all the time. It's like led to a, a very personal transformation as well, like in my family and in, in my own life. Mm -hmm. um, but that exercise, I just also point to. Totally. Yeah. It, it, oh, Milta, please. Well, it's just that, not just, because none of this is just. This is deep and intense and personal, you know? So when you hear people talk about don't take it personal, that's bullshit, excuse me. Um, but that wasn't French, that was straight up English, you know? <laughs> because this is extremely personal. We must deal with the beast within, how we've been socialized to distance ourselves, all of us, okay? From those whose we come from. And especially for those of you that have come to be known as white. And look, I know what I look like, okay? So I, I have white moments, you know? I, I understand that. Um, but being an obviously black person, I can see in the faces of my brothers and sisters, right? What, what happens when we're asked to do anything. We go back to whose we are because that's the source of our capacity building. All right. And for, for those that have come to be known as white, the construct asks you to divorce yourself from them, to sustain an identity that is only in the I. There's no intimacy in I. It is just a barren space that you must fill up with doing rather than being. Okay. So, so I, I, you know, I so honor, and this is not to center whiteness. This is to define it in the construct of dehumanization. Okay. So we must be vested in the humanizing of ourselves, the beast within, and then, you know, it con consistently reflecting that so that we can deal with the beast without. Rachel? Thank you for that reflection, Milta. And it, uh, Danae and James, both of you describing that moment of the, the call for white ancestors to enter the space feels like um, when we were having a conversation this week to prepare for this conversation, um, one of the things that you said amongst, amongst many like important reflections, Milta, was the moment where the work goes from transactional to transformational. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, Danae, if, if I can, I remember about a, a year ago um, on a panel for the Broadway Advocacy Coalition, you actually spoke a bit about Milta's role in the room, which is one of our topics here of like what is what is a process chaplain? Um, and James, certainly, you just spoke to it a bit with the the story of of the side conversation that you and Milta had. But I wonder if Danae, I can I can look to you for a moment to talk more about what is a process chaplain, uh, and what has it meant to you in this process? Process. Wow. Yes. I mean, there's so many. It's something that I think I maybe even learned in the room. I think we all did. We learned every day how indispensable Milta's role <laughs> is to our company. And I like, I mean, even now I have to pull out a notebook every time she has anything to say. I'm always like, oh my God, I have to write that down. And you know, and I think at the beginning, I'm not, I'm not sure, Rachel, what your specific intention was when when Milta was originally invited into the space, but I feel like I originally understood it as an educator and then it shifted and became a, a vital company member like a she is a co-creator with us of not only the piece but the safety to create the piece and i think that we are all kind of brilliant star seeds in our own right but her leadership power in that way i think helps us navigate when we reach these walls there are times where I feel like Mother Milta is sitting at the table with us. And sometimes I have these images of, of 
her sitting right outside the circle as we kind of get stuck in loops about something and every once in a while refereeing and go and pause. Remember, race <laughs> is still psychosis. Like if this isn't, <laughs> you need to understand it in order not to be harmful and bound by it, but it, it doesn't make sense. And there's a reason why you're stuck in a loop. And so it's something as literal as that to being able to guide us through really deeply spiritual work that we've done in this room that um, became ceremony and ritual. And I think that when we talk about um, leaving room for spirit in our room, it became like James was saying, much more than a theater exercise. It was like, no, we're calling in real ancestral sacred practices. And not everyone in the room had the language to handle those rituals with the respect that they deserve and the protocol. And I feel like Milta's role also became a guide in that way as well, where I felt like we were able to honor those practices without appropriating, without causing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. without playing playing house around this stuff. Like we're gonna call in the ancestors and name the Orishas, like are we bringing the offerings that they deserve? Are Gosh. we, you know, um, there was that too in, yeah, that like the anti-racism work that we decided to make a piece about isn't like, let's write a fun play about this. I think we all realized very quickly that <laughs> we were bringing our souls and our flesh to this. And I think um, Milta was always there to, I think, ground the sacredness of that. So we never really forgot the what we were really doing. So that's, yeah, a big, big, broad answer, but different moments that stick out to me. Beautiful answer. Um, I would love to know what the fun play is about anti-racism. <laughs> um, the yeah. anti-racist musical. Yeah, Sorry, exactly. Go <laughs> um, James, actually building off of what, what Danae just spoke to about the sacred, um, and this will get into, so maybe you can unpack a little bit about at least one of or some of the tracks uh, narratively that you were working on in mm -hmm. for reconstruction. Um, and Danae, I'll ask you in a bit to do the same of like some of the character work that has been developing. But I know that James um, would love for you to talk about that, that work with a uh, partner who is not here, but Jerome Ellis, um, uh, not here for this conversation today, very much uh, here for reconstruction. And uh, and thinking about in particular a word that you both have talked about, which is the miraculous and the role of uh, uh, the question as to whether the intimacy can only be miraculous. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a, there's a few different story, I almost said plot tracks in Reconstruction and plot feels not like not the right word at all. <laughs> um, but there are a few different story tracks that we've been exploring. Um, and one of the main ones that I've been working on is a lot with uh, Jerome Ellis, an extraordinary writer, composer, artist, genius, um, who is also my main, my primary creative collaborator just in my theater career and is also um, who I would call my closest friend in the world and is also someone I've known since I was 10 years old. So there's a lot of relationships happening at once um, along with, uh, I am, you know, obviously a, a white identifying American and he is a black Caribbean American. Um, so part of the track of the, one of the tracks of the show is exploring, is us exploring our friendship um, and how it functions. And gosh, I could say a whole lot about that. Um, the main th first thing I guess I want to say is um, he, because he wasn't able to be on this call, he's traveling today. Um, he and I talked on the phone ahead of time just to, I wanted to kind of clear, what are you? how do you feel about me talking about different things, anything specifically you want me to say? And I do want to say that he, he said, I, I trust whatever you want to talk about and say um, feels fine to me. But then I, I wish to give um, my own personal caveat, which is I, I would encourage anyone watching and any human being to be healthily skeptical and suspicious anytime 
a white person is speaking on behalf of uh, a black person who is not present in any way. So I just say that to say, I'm sure I will get things wrong. And if he were here, I'm sure he would refine, correct, disagree, et cetera. Um, he's the person who's like closest in the world to me. And, and in terms of this, like getting your skin in the game, in addition to the ancestor work, what's been very challenging, I'll say for me personally, in, in like exploring our friendship and the, the racial dynamics of it, are I feel so strongly that he is the person, that he is both the person who knows me best in the world. And I feel I know no one more deeply than I know Jerome. But in addition, I feel like what's become clear and has been part of the acceptance and moving through for me is like, and there are so many ways I will never know him. And like, I just can't know him because of, I really appreciate the way you phrased it, Danae, earlier, something like our ancestors have given us no reason to trust us. Like there are just certain, ex obviously there's the surface level, like experiences I will never have, but also just, there are just some spaces that I like, like metaphysical spaces in addition to literal spaces that we like can't both go to in the same way, which has been enormously painful for me. And I, I, I genuinely don't wanna speak for him, but I just offer, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't compare to levels of pain he experiences involving our relationship as well, which is some of what we're exploring in the piece. Um, and just a, a sentence that came up one day while we were working was, well, I, Jerome and I often get seen, I think, especially by like theater institutions who really love to put us forward because I, I think that people like to look at us and say like, that's the answer. Like, look, a black man and a white man are like getting along and deal, doing the work. Um, and I just am very suspect of that. I don't like the idea that like we're the answer or that there's not an enormous amount of cruelty still underlying our interactions or power dynamics that are unfair or have to be worked through. Um, but also I do feel that we, some well, sometimes I feel we transcend those things. Sometimes I feel we never will. Um, and a sentence that I said once in a recent workshop that we were doing on this piece was, I just asked like, will it ever be possible for me and Jerome or more broadly, like a white identifying person and a black identifying person in America to experience an intimacy that is not miraculous, that is just like an earthly, normal intimacy and is the answer no? Is like the only form of intimacy possible always going to feel like a miracle has occurred across a great distance? And if that's true, is that a blessing or is that actually a curse? Like, is it a horrible thing that Jerome and I can't have any form of intimate friendship that doesn't feel like it's happening despite all odds? Um, I say again, not wanting to lean into some idea that like we have figured it out. I don't think that's true. Um, I could talk a lot more about like my theological feelings on that and it feels unnecessary. <laughs> I feel like, like I just, I, or what I do, I guess wanna say is like, there's, as I sort of articulated, like recognizing the distance between me and the person in the world I feel closest to is both enormously painful, also full of tremendous, a sense of grace and the miraculous, as I said, and that leads to more pain, which like leads to more of a sense of the miraculous and like more love and more pain. Um, and I'm trying to accept that that's just like the rest of, um, maybe that's also another idea of like what intimacy is, if you really wanna dig into the past. And just the last thing I just wanna say that I only occurred to me on this call as we're talking about ancestors, is I'm thinking now like, it almost feels to me like it's not that white ancestors weren't already in the room. It was like unfair that we weren't naming them. Like they were there and they were operating and like we, I wear them every day and they like allow me to speak in certain ways or have certain expectations. Like they're in the room holding forth and it's unfair to ignore beyond unfair it's so many other things but to to act like i'm there alone is actually a deception like i think both we were inviting them in but also we were just admitting that they were there and operating is sort of how i feel danae or milta do you wanna go oh milta you are muted and i want we want to hear you Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just want to underscore what you just said, James, because it is essential that 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 aspect of the truth, truth, okay, be you know, be be known. Because we don't travel alone. No one does. It's impossible. You didn't hatch yourself. You know, you were hatched, <laughs> you know, and that's the connection, right? And the, the, the saddest part about the construct of racism is that it removes you from that. So that those that have come to be known as white are cut off at the neck. You know, because you're, you know, it's in your heart that you connect with our, that we connect with our ancestors, right? It's, it's, it's in, it's, you know, it comes beyond just what we think, but the epistemology of whiteness is I am because I think, you know, so knowing the heart is your contractual agreement with the construct to not go at because the minute that you go to the heart, you realize you're not alone. And that your we is more important than your I. And I'll stop there. I said. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, I'm very grateful for the naming of that, James. And, the, and also the eeriness of that. We've been, uh, <laughs> as some watching might know from images, the one of the central images is this house that gets deconstructed, reconstructed, deconstructed, reconstructed. Uh, and that is a uh, mid flood and maybe underwater and maybe on a college campus and maybe in the 16, 1700s and maybe in the 21st century or in the future. Um, and this idea of, of haunting within that um, is very, very present for the show. Um, Danae, I wonder, A, broadly, any thoughts that you have that have come up from this, but also be thinking about Lady D. And, uh, and I know there are so many different strands of Lady D that are still very emergent in terms of the character, as well as any other characters or tracks that you might wanna talk about and how maybe you have been thinking about intimacy with Kristen as uh, and or Lady, the character that Kristen is playing, with Jillian and Professor Lowe and this relationship that is very nascent, but that Issa Davis, one of the other uh, extraordinary writer makers has been kind of writing towards is that relationship between Lady D and Professor Lowe. Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like um, Lady D, the Lady D and Lady were exciting discoveries for us because I think in our room, we can spend a lot of time in um, talking space, really like working through these ideas and concepts and feelings. And then in a very spiritual space of doing these rituals. And then every, but then when we play and we are like, this is, we're moving into the theatrical space where we're on our feet doing an improv or moving on our feet with a prompt, then real like characters and text start to come out. And I feel like Lady D and and D and Lady were one of those characters where um we were doing a free open play and I, as what I, who I now know as Lady D, tied me and Kristen's ankles together with this rope that was working as Mama Luana's hair. Um, and that concept of intimacy became so clear because in this role play of either Lady as the mistress of this plantation and Lady D as an enslaved person on this plantation and or a hundred years in the future, they cannot get free of one another. And nor do you know if they really want to. And I think that for me, it came from this idea that whiteness can create this illusion that they are free from this. Whereas we're never quite under that illusion. And they are an example of two women who were stuck together, but there is no intimacy. There is no safety, there is no trust, but they are also, their lives depend on each other. And I think that 
to me, that's that's a that's the America we're living in. Our lives really do depend on each other, but there's no trust. And you watch, we watch these characters from what we can see now. You you don't know if they're going to work it out. It kind of it it gets rotten and toxic. But there's also they 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 needed each other. They need each other, or at least Lady needs Lady D. I'm not sure. There's so many questions still. I think in that dynamic that I'm really interested in and. Um, and then as far as Professor Lowe, who is black and clearly of a future, like she clearly exists now or in the, you know, not any younger, I imagine than 1970 is, um, and Lady D, the other black woman, they don't necessarily have the kinship that you think they would have either. Professor Lowe is sort of searching for this way in that, um, and I, and I, I feel to me it reflected a relationship that I can even feel between me when I think about my blackness and my queerness and my womanness and all this language I have. And when I talk to my grandmother about it and she's like, what are you talking about? Like, just be, you know, and that kind of disconnect that can happen. And times where Professor Lowe and Lady, the white woman can have easier conversation than Lady D and Professor Lowe, but there's a trust between Lady D and Professor Lowe that neither of them can have with the white woman. And so it just becomes this, you can look at the relationship in so many ways and those are characters that I feel like were completely born out of these conversations and turned into tangible um, like theatrical characters that we're going to watch develop and tell us stories in that way um, and kind of held sometimes in contrast and sometimes not to the points in the piece where we will see James and Jerome work so beautifully as if from one brain and then we see Lady D and Lady, it, it, they hate each other, but they are, <laughs> they are in, in, inextricably linked and they live in a home together. And, you know, it's this real, it's fascinating. Yeah. 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 And certainly one of the things that we talked about, and it feels like uh, this too feels like a moment where the process begins to go, oh, and now, right, we're moving into this space but is the hunger for particularly making sure there's places, places that are both focused on black interiority and black intimacy apart from mm -hmm. the white characters entirely. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a line that I'm not looking at, so I apologize that I'm gonna paraphrase it because it's a beautiful line that Jillian wrote, uh, but something to the effect of is black interiority reflected in white and reverse how does black interiority exist apart from white yeah. interiority mm -hmm. um as being one of the central questions that her character is is as you said searching for gra mm -hmm. grappling with um we're beginning to get questions from list from listeners and watchers and i will certainly encourage um, folks watching to, to put those through. Milta, I would love to direct sort of, uh, I'm gonna synthesize a couple of these, okay. um, but I, I wonder if you can speak to actually if and how you have worked with artists prior to this process, because I know that has been yeah. a part of practice. And, um, and if you want to speak a bit to like how just tangibly some of the things that you have done in this room, including, as Danae said, first starting as a, in very much an educational role and kind of how those tools have shifted for you. Right. So, yeah, uh, well, <laughs> I've always called myself a curator rather than a facilitator because the work of anti-racism is really about bringing forward um, everyone's highest capacity for humanity and their highest level of, you know, living life in, you know, in a way where we're cognizant and embracing, you know, humanity, both ours, you know, when we find it, <laughs> and, you know, those in, in our lives. Um, so curating 
anti-racist uh, workshops um, was exactly what brought me to work with artists and to um, co-develop and, and co-create um, uh, a group of artists that is called Acre. Uh, and it's artists coming together to create real equity in the field across the board and these are artists that are self-named self-proclaimed uh, they don't have to have a degree to be called an artist and um, moves through their process very uh, connected to um, to a race analysis and that is the foundation for the work that we're doing with uh, reconstruction that we all sit with the same language about race with the same definition about race and we enter it with a commitment to continue to learn and that's all of us there's never a workshop you know and uh, a talk a lecture that i do or give and i've been doing this for the past 20 years cons consistently COVID has not stopped the work in fact it's increased it <laughs> particularly as white people have become more called to do the work okay um and this is not i don't do work of, on just creating statements but this is about how we're, we're going to live this process process and this is what we do in in the room with reconstruction I've done it with acre I there are many other uh, institutions and organizations that I have worked with prior and after um, uh, working with the team and reconstruction and you can always go onto my website and and look at that but the point is this the point is that I have a bias in my work and I've said I say this out loud and people know about it and that is when the artists get it, the culture will change. There is no doubt. There is no doubt in my living, every living cell in my body that that is the road. Now, it doesn't mean that no one else is important. That is not what I am saying. But you see, I'm shifting from the, you know, the concept that we have been socialized uh, of, you know, depletion and, you know, the lack. I, I am looking at the incredible capacity that we have, no matter what we bring to the table, educators, medical providers, you know, community organizers, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, we're all part of this incredible possibility. Artists are responsible for rooting us. You are responsible for rooting us. And so, so my work has been, because I believe that that is what is real, then I've been pulled in the direction of working uh, predominantly with artists in this way. And I still, because I, I am a trained medical uh, provider, you know, I deal very heavily in the medical field and with, you know, the development of, you know, a third reconstruction a third reconstruction in our existence in the United States, both as people of color and as those that have come to be known as white. And that is a vision for 50 years from now, where equity, which is the opposite of racism, exists. And that miraculousness then goes away and becomes a new norm because it's never been norm, James, because there's no norm for people of color. We're in constant flux. You know, trying trying to stay alive. There. Does that help? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Danae and James, actually, before I move to that next question, I wondered if either of you have thoughts you might want to share about how this work, this way of working, this work specifically, um, have been impacting your other lot like other projects other the many existences sort of every um artist uh and thinker in that room lead um and or if there are previous experiences that you had had that strongly resonate with ways of working that we've had in this room that you want to share Who I, I guess I can. It it feels like an enormous question. I could talk for nine hours about it. Um, both. 
I've definitely never worked this way before. And it's really shifted, I'll say, a lot of the ways I've thought of working. Like, like I guess a small thing I guess I'll just say is, I think before I liked to, it, a way I think I thought about some of these things was like, oh, what are the like small solutions to these problems? Like, what are, what, like maybe if we just do this. And one way of thinking this room has created for me going forward is like, the small solutions sometimes make it worse. Like, they, like it gives an illusion of fixing things. And by that, I guess I mean like, like a small solution to a thing that I hear comes up a lot in, in like racial dynamics in a rehearsal room is like, let's have regular workshops where we like do a couple exercises and we talk about it and otherwise we'll like operate in the same way versus a question of like, where does the money come from? Who gets it? And how does it get to those people? Who is allowed to, these are questions I now think about in a process or even like, like how is a safe space created for people of color to actually have a conversation about how they're feeling in the process? What does that safety actually mean? How radically do I have to like slow down the entire creative process for that to happen? Something that Jillian Walker said in one of our days I remember I just remember somebody, I think a, a white artist made very possibly myself said something about like, we're really, really trying to be careful that like white people aren't speaking more often than, than uh, black identifying artists in the room. And Jillian just immediately said, there are a thousand more ways that whiteness dominates the space than just the literal <laughs> amount of time someone is speaking. And so I guess that's what I mean is like how intensely and how rewarding, but like, it can be so tempting, I think, as a white artist or any white company or institution to be like, oh, I have to do this, this, that. What do I have to do for business to keep operating as normal versus sure. like, no, business just can't keep operating, which many people have said. But that's something I think I've been thinking about a lot. I think for me, it's given me a real profound respect for myself and my own needs in that uh, w when especially doing any work that that pertains to the intentionality of digging into race, that black artists, we and white artists will have different needs in that space. And um, there was a time where it became very clear that we needed separate spaces to process what was coming up. And that the white actors were discovering things that the black actors already knew. And we needed space to process rage and discomfort. And that was one of the very tangible things that Milta was like, we can practice contingency groups for a while where you're able to separate into the groups that you identify with. And we separated basically black and indigenous and white, those who've come to be known as white and that we had different needs and that it's not about creating this illusion that we have the same needs, but like, are we willing to take the time to do those literal practices that give us time to process so that we can continue to come together safely um, and I think that it, I, I don't know, I think that this, the, the conditioning that you can have as a black person over time is that it is all yours to carry. And I think this room really helped me unlearn some of that. And there was like, oh no, there is work and discoveries that is, that are to be made for the white actors and creators in this space. That's not mine to carry and vice versa. And so I think that there were tangible practices that now when I go into other workspaces, there are, if it's, there are conversations that I don't even choose to have in certain environments and I value my own safety a lot more than I used to. I think I used to think it was liberation by putting my wrists on the line for someone who never showed me that, that they deserve that level of trust for that type of wisdom. And so you can't create the same intimacy in every space and I think it's actually made me a bit more boundaried in my other work environments than I was before. Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like um, how the constituency groups have continued evolving also, like la about a year ago during one of the Zooms, I can remember Jillian saying, I want a femme constituency group. <laughs> and it was like amazing also to feel like mm -hmm. uh, it's not, there is no beyond, it's just additive. Mm. And just to be like continuing to expand sort of all of these different ways we can be accessing our the full selves. Yeah, uh, we had and the, the James and Jerome constituency group and everyone who's not James and Jerome constituency group <laughs> and the most recent <laughs> workshop. Yes. 
like a nut, so, one of a million facets. <laughs> and also allowing things to evolve. Because I another thing I remember after we did that white ancestor exercise is that we didn't need them as much anymore. After that day, we were like, oh, we don't need a constituency group. Everything that has the like cost of everything that was said has equalized the the safety space in a way that we didn't necessarily need to go separate to debrief in those couple of days. And so I think it is allowing for the presence of listening to what is needed that day versus what James was saying, like, this is our protocol. And this is what we do now to avoid all discomfort forever. It's like, no, 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 no. The discomfort's there forever. Mm -hmm. And every day we create a new safe space That's right. and we have That's tools, right. you know? And it's beyond a safe space. It's a liberated space mm. yeah. because it is prickly. It is yeah. angry. It's angry. It is scary. It is fierce. It is dynamic. Okay. All of those things, it is alive. Yes. You know, so we step into it and then we step with it through the process. And it's amazing because, again, it changes both, you know, what's happening inside of us because we take it with us. And then it changes how we deal with everything else, including the grocery store owner or the cat, you know, <laughs> we become more connected to the humanity of every process. Mm -hmm. And that is liberation. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, we're getting a number of questions and I'm aware we're almost at time about tangible practices and things. I, I think the constituency groups have been a huge one. I can also say like even that initial day of deep education that Milta was your first right. time in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Which was um, a day long workshop essentially mm -hmm. on uh, white supremacy, on decolonization, um, was on a power. huge on power. Thank you. And mm -hmm. class came and up. Class. That, uh, Absolutely. 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 Um, and learning a language that we were going to be able to use in practice, um, that moved us through, you know, understanding because words do not define themselves uh, based on who we are and where we are in this new society that will determine what our words mean. And for true intimacy, we have to be able to tell each other where we're at. Yeah, that's one of the ways that we've defined it actually, which I feel like came in part off of something that you brought into the room, Danae. Um, but this idea that a way amongst the many to define intimacy is a deep understanding of what is actually being exchanged in any uh, given moment of time, mm. which feels like it goes to Milt to what you're talking about of a yeah. shared, yeah, yeah, a shared language. Yeah. Um, Jane, or, do you want, oh, please, sorry. No, or action or deed or the lack thereof, or the choice, as Danae said, to not give at that moment, mm. okay? As an obviously black woman, you know, in America, a choice to not give has never been a choice, uh -huh. you know? So to create that space is a tool. And if people are asking for skills and tools, there you got it, uh -huh. you know? That's one of them. And I think one of those tangible practices is, as you understand your power as a director, Rachel, as Jalen, who couldn't be here with us, is allowing for that kind of sovereignty. There were days where the exhaustion was there and Jillian would be like, I'm not speaking anymore for the next couple hours. I'll be sitting in a corner. <laughs> you guys can process. That's and right. times where Ian would just step away and lay on the floor. That's and, right. That's and right. If I really did that every time I felt harmed in one of the dominant white spaces I work in, you know, there's there, you understand how truly little space there is for your own sovereignty and the vital, the vital tangible work of that in our room mm -hmm. and um, taking the time for those check-ins at the beginning of the day. Right. I think people imagine, I'm seeing the questions. I think they imagine that we're doing these like grand, you know, cauldron <laughs> of exercises and how small it is is really just about carving out time to be with what's actually there. 
That's right. You know, That's right. Um, and take off the train of, well, we have to get this done in the seven minutes before our five minute break, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that creates so much violence in rooms. And yes. you know what? That, that whole piece about time. Because what, what we're saying is that, w you know, we decided to create and you brought me into to assure that I could curate a space where the, you know, the manifestation of time was not on time as in white culture, but in time as in where we stand and the we being capital W-E. Yes, and homage to, amongst many other thinkers, thinkers Brittany Cooper, uh, oh, sure. Professor Cooper, who um, whose lectures we have watched. Uh, mm -hmm. James, were you gonna add in? I was just gonna say, I think something that to me has been important that's sounds more businessy or like capitalist or whatever you want to call it, but I think is the opposite, is that this, we are also paid for all of that time. Like what I mean to say is like these mm -hmm. constituency groups where it was like after the rehearsal, after the rehearsal, mm -hmm. we'll like go into these, you know, maybe the white identifying artists in one space, people of color in another space. That wasn't after rehearsal. That was an hour of the rehearsal day paid. Additionally, like, when we went to the anti-racism workshop with Milta, that was paid when it, and even there were conversations about, you know, should white identifying artists and, and people of color be paid the same? I say that to say like, it costs, there is a cost, like an emotional cost, but also like, to me, it was important that it, it, it was financially inefficient to do this, but like spiritually deeply efficient to do so. To me, that was just Im important. It made it like, like when Jerome and I were working, something we asked for was we were like, can we have as much time as we want at the end of every day, but it's still like paid rehearsal time for mm -hmm. us to just say like, how, as friends, me, just me and you, like, how is our friendship? Do we need to unpack this? There was mm -hmm. financial room for us to say like, this is what this costs us and like, I guess to me that was just that's to me a, a tangible thing that institutions and and sure. artists can do is like pay mm -hmm. people for <laughs> the app for what you're actually asking them for rather than kind of secretly threaten them to have to do this work or like want to get the benefits of it without paying for it. There all. you go. Mm -hmm. sure. Yes, yes. Um, Ilana, I think, I think, um, I know we're reaching time, so you should, you should please feel free to join us. I just want to see if this room has, yeah, just any more thoughts that you want to add in this, in the, yeah, stuff that has been bubbling up for you or from looking at chat or whatever. Yeah, I want to speak to one question about the constitu constituency groups, if we do an exercise and then break out and then, you know, it's interesting. There's a, it, we've tapped into like the pulse of our room. So we get things done, but it, it sometimes they didn't happen at the end of the day. Sometimes you watched a lecture and it really pissed someone off and it was like, I need to go process this. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> Black people, let's go to this room and talk and scream and cry mm -hmm. for a second. And, mm -hmm. you know, or Kristen sometimes would be like, I'm feeling my white fragility come up and it's not my job to work this out with you. So I need to go process for a minute. And so it is allowing it to be something that's living and breathing in real time mm -hmm. to be this place to mitigate and hold the complexity and the nuance. So it's not quite, it's not always quite such a neat structure, I that's guess right. I want to say. And that the anti-racism, anti-capitalist work is, do you value do you value that as much as you value the end result and understand that you can't get the end result without taking the time for things like that if gotcha. you want it to be one that is that is full of the life you want you know gotcha. Gotcha. yes that really speaks to something that Jalen said yesterday um at, at the end of the weavers we were doing uh jillian invited like one word or very brief reactions to the week as like just a final checkout and Jalen said, inefficient does not mean ineffective. Oof. I and, said it. I said. <laughs> yeah, and it was it goes to exactly yes, what you were saying, Danae, mm -hmm. and, and 
And James, I'm really struck by, I think you, I, whether you use cost effective, right? Like if the goal, if what the investment is going to is the type of work that can only begin to emerge from creating this kind of time, then there is nothing that is more cost. <laughs> you know, there's no, and there's no, I, I always even take umbrage at the word exercise because it, 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 it's, I always think that we are building, we don't know what we're building, but it's, it's not a, there's not, as you say, Danae, like a cleanness to it, where like, we're going to do this exercise and it's going to expand our ranges in this way. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of always trying to give shape to the mystery in some way. And, and mm -hmm. that's actually where the, the bulk of how the team has been working on this is are these prompts or writing assignments or thinking assignments, or feeling assignments, <laughs> which is where the white ancestor prompt came from. And that's, a I think, a very different thing than an exercise, mm -hmm. uh, which to me always feels much more prescribed, like you know what you're going to get out of it in the end. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful place to wrap up, and I am so honored to even be in this same Zoom room with you. Thank you so much for this very heartfelt, gritty, um, passionate, and honest conversation. And thanks to all of the people out there for adding their questions. Um, it was really helpful to guide this conversation. So, is there anything uh, from the team that you want to last thoughts? Last comments, good to go. Okay, well, for those of you who are in, I'm sorry, I'll pause, did you have anything? So um, you can always watch this conversation or share it with friends. Uh, it's on our website at thebroadstage.org. The third installment of Reveal Reconstruction uh, will be presented on May 15th at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So please go to the website to RSVP or you know, watch it on our website. I know personally that I'm really looking forward to being in the audience live to, with all of you to see Reconstruction on the Broad stage. And so until then, stay tuned, uh, stay in touch, stay healthy, and we will come back together um, for reconstruction and all of the commission projects that the Broad Stage is excited to bring to Los Angeles. Take care and have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Adios.